Huh? Anybody? Any? Mm -hmm. You are? Are folks sold on Mary Burke's run for governor? Or are folks kind of saying out of it? Or? I gotta look more into it. No? Maybe you should explain what's happening right now. We are so uneducated. <laughs> Public schools. So, <laughs> the reason why I'm saying these things is that because that's what you, that's what your political system. So you're looking at me like, dude, you're fucking absurd. You're crazy. <laughs> what the fuck are you fucking? I'm confusing you. That's your political system. So you're looking at me crazy, and every day you're living in a system that's telling you how to think, when to think, and when to do it, while they're doing something the complete opposite. But got you all confused on these wedge issues and these labels and, and, and race and class and sex. I mean, they're doing this to you every day, right? So, like, you'll, you'll, it'll, it'll be an election cycle and you'll see a special interest commercial about women's rights. Now, now, you might care about jobs. At the end of the day, you might care about jobs in the economy. You might care about lower tuition costs. But you're not seeing that, right? You're not seeing ads about lower tuition costs. You're not seeing ad, truthful ads about jobs and economic development. You're talking about gay rights. You're talking about women's rights. They're using coded language to talk about poor people, the 47%, the 98%. They're talking about thugs and extreme law and order. But jobs are being created. The economy is, is dwindling down. And there are more people who probably don't even believe in those type of things. But you're hearing it because that's the way politics works. It creates a culture of um, confrontation. Not a culture of cooperation, not a culture of compromise anymore. It's a, it's a more radicalized way of attaining power and pushing through radical agendas. And right now in Wisconsin, in the state political system, you have Governor Walker, you have a Republican Assembly, and a Republican Senate. And you have moderate Republicans, folks who think, who, who might vote, who might, might identify as Republicans, willing to work across the aisle, who might believe in pro, who, who might be pro-union, pro-public education. But now they're so polarized <clears throat> that they have to take these very staunch, narrow, rig, rigid ways of, of legislating, and it's leaving everybody out of the political discourse. And there's no challenge to it because they have pretty much created a situation where they have the next they have power for the next ten years through redistricting. Mm -hmm. You know, so when you look at it, when you look at the elections in twenty in twenty ten, I worked the Barrett race, got our asses kicked, right? Mm -hmm. But what you saw that year wasn't a Wisconsin only thing, right? Like across the country, midterm elections were crazy. The Tea Party rose up. Folks were mad about the Affordable Care Act. There was an anti-incumbency thing happening nationally. You saw the Supreme Court rule on corporate, corporate donors and corporate personhood that created super PACs and all these special interest groups that were flooding uh, states with money that liberal or democratic progressive organizations like unions could not match dollar to dollar what was happening, right? And so the context of 2010 was White rage, to be honest with you. White people having to pay for health care for blacks and browns and gays. Uh, racism with, with the first black president. Like, you saw a bunch of American pie hatred just bubble up. Where folks started voting against their own interests. Where you had white, blue-collar males voting for Walker, even though Walker's policies are not for blue-collar white men. Because he was feeding into this anti-Milwaukee, anti-progress, anti-humanist movement that was really being funded. And we thought it was being funded by grassroots right, white radicals, right? No, Koch brothers, corporations, rich people. Like funneling their money into these grassroots organizations to stage rallies, have provocateurs in rallies, talking about and, and generate conversation around anything but the issue. Confusing people, scaring people, scaring the elderly about uh, Medicare, Medicaid changes due to the Affordable Care Act. There's all type of nonsense going on that I saw up close and personal, you know, working, working in campaigns. And so now they get in office and they're choosing their own voters. Now this has been going on since the beginning of time. It's not a Democratic, not a Republican thing, right? But what they did was <laughs> they did some illegal things. 
to really make sure that white districts maintain even wider and Republican districts were even more Republican. So it's no more leaning Republican, no more leaning Democrat. It's like polarized Democratic Republican districts, white black districts. So now you're homogenizing the, the political culture in those districts. Now I don't have to think about diversity. Now I don't have to think about issues outside of my own context, my own paradigm. So I'm creating a culture through these wedge issues funneled by corporate interests to divide voters, right? Okay, so three years later, what's happened? All type of shit has happened. Act 10 happened. Stripping the collective bargaining rights that they told the people, you know what, these union taxpayer draining thugs <coughs> are taking all your money, man. Look at you working in the private sector. You don't even have a pension no more. You got a 401k or 403k. Look, these, these union thugs have a pension. And folks bought into that. Like, they literally started demonizing folks for having pensions because they worked in the public sector. The conversation wasn't, whoa, why do corporations, why are corporations moving from defined benefit plans to 401ks? Why are they decreasing their matches to their employees, to the employees when they're generating record profits and not paying their fair share of taxes? So the conversation shifted from what was really happening to, the, to hatred of other people. And it really was white people arguing with other white people, like white liberals are with white Republicans. Black folks, we just, you know, tend to get caught in the middle of these fights. And so, you know, we were just watching people just rebel. Let's have some recalls. But the conversation wasn't really shifting to what was happening to the people, to the average Wisconsinite, to the average Milwaukee, to the average person, to the average student. Nothing was being talked about. You guys saw your voter rights being attacked. Now all of a sudden your college IDs aren't enough. We, you need more IDs to vote, college students. Because you're a liar. You're, you're lying about living here and going to school here. That's what they said. <laughs> but it's really because they didn't want college students to vote because specifically college, young college voters vote democratically. Then they changed the primary date. The primaries used to be in September. Now they're in August. Why? School's not in session. Let's, let's make sure they're not in school to be around to vote and be keyed into the election. So we care so much about democracy. So you're creating a culture of divide and conquer, right? You got people hate, you got private hating public, public hating private. You got parents hating teachers. Now all of a sudden we hate teachers. They're stupid. They don't do their job. No, I've had some stupid teachers. Don't know why. But I'm demonizing the teaching profession. I'm beating down on teachers. I'm making teaching seem like missionary work, just do it for free. You shouldn't have to earn, you shouldn't be able to earn, the, earn a living in this economy as a teacher. So now you see people hating public education, education reform. Now you see the expansion of voucher schools for rich families. Now you see public dollars going to private schooling for people who can already afford it. At the same time, you see Republicans cutting back on unemployment. And that's a national thing, too. Not extending unemployment benefits, making you wait a week before those benefits kick in, making it more invasive of them to basically say, you, to deny you those rights. So we're not free for the past few years. We basically hurt the economy through the collective bargaining bill. Wisconsin's lagging in job growth. He's nowhere close to creating 250,000 jobs. And these are facts. This has nothing to do with my partisan lens. These are just facts of the, of the reality of what we live in, right? All these things are happening. But what are we still talking about? Gay rights, women's rights, things to polarize people, things to feed into the sense of those, those deep, like I said, American values of division, racism, sexism, classism. And all the while, rich folks, predominantly white, are making money off of us. And the reason why I want to talk to you about the culture of politics is because, based off those contexts, that defines public policy. That feeds the narrative. That drives the messaging. So when we talk about 10 to an hour, even the way that it's framed, it's not being talked about the way it should be talked about. You should be talking about catching up to the rate of inflation all these years. Because wages have stagnated, the minimum wage has not increased, and so when you look at other countries who are not a super, who are not superpowers, 
their minimum wage was 15, 17, 20 bucks an hour. And in, in America, the superpower, the most wealthiest country in the world, we're debating about raising it to 10, 10. Why? We're the leader of democracy. That's what we tell ourselves. Like, we are the model for how, for how this world should operate. All right? We, we file injunctions with, with other companies. They don't have the same human rights clauses as we do. So at, but we're the country with the biggest gap in income equality. Something's not making sense here. We have the biggest rates of incarceration. We have private prisons now. Ooh. Like, there's a lot of things happening, but the right questions aren't being answered because we've created a culture of division. And it's worked. It, it's really worked. And so the reason why I love local and state politics, I don't really love state politics, but I love local politics, is because it's not part of it. You can really work with people on issue by issue to get things done. Because at the end of the day, the biggest thing for, the, for people in my community, they want jobs. They want an opportunity to own a home, to own a business, to have dignity and, and getting a paycheck. I talk to more people who want to work than those who want a handout. 